references to they live, its themes, its ideas, they're kind of everywhere and everybody sort of had their pound of flesh from that film. Well, I think They Live is something that is clearly really rooted in its time, but I still think that kind of sense of an inequality, a 1%, is something that has still maintained lots and lots of relevance for us now. First time I actually saw They Live, I was given it as a sort of bootleg DVD copy. A mate of mine he knew I was a bit of a carpenter buff and I was sort of going through his back catalogue and he came into the studio one day and said if you've not seen this you've got to see this and it was just a blank CD with the live scroll on it. I literally went home that evening and I stuck it in the DVD player and my mind was blown. In 1988, They Live was a low point for John Carpenter. Certainly not viewed as a landmark of science fiction, it failed to match the acclaim of genre classics like Halloween and Escape from New York. But 30 years later, the politics underpinning They Live's B-movie nuance, extensive punch-ups and tongue-in-cheek one-liners are just as relevant now, if not more. I had this sort of strange sense of deja vu. It was like I'd seen it before. What I realise now is that that was all the references that other people have made that I've seen and not seen the actual film. You know, the old base stuff. I, I knew Barbara Kruger's work before, of course, and it sort of does hint at that, and I knew uh, Jenny Halls' work. Um, so I think it was a lot of those sort of sources coming together. Triggered a lot of things in my head, thinking, where have I seen this? Where have I seen this? In a way, it's a homage to 50s B-movies, science fiction B-movies, the kind of things that really influenced John Carpenter when he was uh, growing up. And it does still have that kind of sense of um, the real kind of energy of... Uh, subcultural critique. It's actually a very literary film in many ways, so it's influenced by lots of science fiction from the 1950s. I always think you need to know the background of Ray Nelson, the story which it's based on, the fact that Ray Nelson was a close friend of Philip K. Dick and they worked together. It echoes really famous short stories like Frederick Pohl's The Tunnel Under the World. So there are lots and lots of textual kind of resources there which make it incredibly rich. And of course it it kind of allows people to, to, to kind of discourse about it, so it kind of produces talk uh, about its um, conspiracy theory behind it. So, in a sense, it, it ramifies itself. It keeps the conversation going long after you've seen it. In this day walk among us tale, Rowdy Roddy Piper plays John Narda, a blue-collar director in Los Angeles. Discovering a pair of sunglasses reveals a shocking truth. Through subliminal messages, high society has ensnared the lower classes to stay downbeat and submissive. But these tyrants aren't just cold and affluent, they're a race of ugly, skull-faced aliens. Horrified, Nada attempts to break their control and begins a violent and often hilarious crusade. It's an absolutely absurd story, but it's tangible enough to give the film an enduring appeal. provides this like answer to a question that, that so many people are asking, you know, maybe the reason that like those people who are in power are callous and so Machiavellianly evil is that they are really ghouls that are, are controlling us. And maybe the reason that the very people that seem so exploited by these ruling classes seem so complacent in the whole thing and leave them willing to like fight to protect it is because they're brainwashed by it. And I think that's an idea that um, people can really relate to and, and really like uh, has resonated with people through the years right from sort of the Reagan and Thatcher era all the way through now. Reaganism and where we are with Trump are, are really closely aligned. Those kind of value systems are very very relevant today but also the impacts of those value systems, the way, the way that Trump is withdrawing government from people's lives so that the people aren't getting looked after properly, that Obamacare is getting abolished. Those things are universal, everybody gets affected by them and everybody can relate to the sort of effects of them and the impacts. When something discusses that, naturally people are a bit able to take that. John Carpenter was very sort of explicit about that um, critique that he was um, delivering about the state of Los Angeles, so these are uh, genuine homeless people being used in the in the film. LA is such a vast, sprawling metropolis. That's not a place where you should be seeing homeless people. That's not a place where people should be struggling to eat and to feed their families and to clothe themselves, you know. 
that kind of sense of an inequality, a 1%, is something that has still maintained lots and lots of relevance for us now. You know, homelessness is a, is a massive factor in, in all society, particularly in Manchester, where we are now, where I live. So I think after Occupy and that sense of having temporary uh, places where people were squatting and in, in land and so on feels incredibly current. Those questions that the film raises uh, have never gone away and they're just as, as relevant and they're just as important as they are today and again that's that idea of this uh, conspiracy theory. Classic kind of Wizard of Oz idea of, uh, of, of lifting the curtain. There's a great bit in the film where Roddy Piper is wearing the glasses and he looks at the TV and he sees the president who's actually a ghoul with the big obey behind him and he's, he's not even sort of surprised he just laughs and says <laughs> it figures it would be something like this. Beyond the politics, they live has enjoyed a healthy dose of pop culture referencing. Notably, the artist Shepard Fairey, who struck a subversive chord with the word obey. Harnessing the word for a sticker campaign, the seed for his brand, Fairey's use of obey wasn't a command, but an effort to stimulate an interpretation created by the viewer's personality. Fairey himself has described the obey sticker as an experiment in phenomology, an attempt to enable people to see something which is before their eyes, but obscured. You see the film you automatically join those kind of dots and it gives you I think a richer <clears throat> I think it gives you a richer experience of his work as well as a, a more in-depth looking at the film itself it's so to the point and direct um, you know he puts on those glasses and he sees the black and white obey the kind of the commands I think I think they influence everybody whether you're typographical or not I think there's there's a there's, a, there's a, a brutalist sort of harshness to them. The clarity that they bring in a world now where your sort of senses are on overload. And it's become like the vernacular of political dissent. Everybody recognises it, whether they're familiar with the film or not. It's quite a subversive act that it's morphed and twisted and through someone else's interpretation and influence has gotten into a place where it might not have gotten directly on its own. But I think for me, it speaks more that the influence and the legacy of the film is the important thing. The fact that it still resonates with artists, creators, designers, whatever, now, and the fact that it can still get into those audiences that might not know what it is. I think it's less important that they know the link and important that they can find it if they want to. I think, for, for me personally, it's, it's, it's a layered film. The ideas and themes in there live. They're actually really, actually amazingly crafted to the point where they're almost explicit in that they know what they're talking about and they're really targeted, but at the same time there's enough wiggle room for people to sort of join up their own little gaps. And, and you know, and that's a success and a failure of the film in some ways, because, in you know, in certain instances, not too many years ago, you know, the, the far right got a hold of their lid and said it was a, you know, a, a kind of Jewish conspiracy film, which Carpenter came out loudly and proudly denied, and rightfully so. But that's what I mean. There's there's a little, enough give in the film for people to sort of read into it how they will, because you can watch this film for 90 minutes and see a political satire, and you can see a, the sociological effects of media of individualism of neoliberalism and what it's like to be working poor or you could just watch a bullshit B movie and it works it still works and I think that fine line is what it's real success is that broadens up so many things for people to love about it